why don't you talk a little bit about your uh the position that you hold and mm -hmm. uh and the work that you've done just in this topic area yeah absolutely so my name is dr eric b villard i am a historian at the u.s army center of military history which is in washington dc at fort mcnair uh, over by the baseball and football stadiums i joined in uh, 2000 after getting my MA and PhD in history at the University of Washington. And so I've been there almost 22 years. I am a Vietnam War specialist, um, although my current title is digital military historian because I do a lot of other things in addition to the research and writing. I do a lot of online, social media, public engagement type things. But first and foremost, I am the Vietnam War historian. That was why they brought me to CMH is, is to work on the book that was published in 2017 called Staying the Course. And it's the third in five combat operation volumes about the US Army in Vietnam. So this is a book that covers period from around October 1967 to September 1968. So it includes the Tet Offensive, but it also includes the lead up to it and the, the period afterward, as well as two more offensives that followed in its wake. So it covers about a year period in 680 pages plus footnotes and bibliography, so it's a real doorstop, but you can also get it on, online at the U.S. Army Center of Military um, website for free as a PDF demo, as indeed all our other material. And I'm currently writing the fourth volume in the Combat Operations Series, which covers the period from um, roughly October, November 1968 through the end of 1969. And the title has not been decided yet, but that'll be out in a few years. But the Tet Offensive in particular has been a passion of mine, virtually my entire, uh, now I'd say adult life, even probably before then. Um, I certainly remember in middle school being fascinated by it. And there's, there's all sorts of reasons. I suppose one is I was born during it. Um, I was, mm -hmm. I was born in early February, 1968. Now, obviously I don't remember the war, but in a way, strange way, I feel this weird connection <laughs> to this event mm -hmm. that happened, you know, halfway around the world. But, uh, yeah, I'm always excited to talk about, uh, Tet Offensive. I think it's one of the most significant military and political and social events of, uh, the second half of the 20th century in the United States. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for thanks for for sharing your you know considerable knowledge about this uh, about the Tet Offensive with with our audience. We have a you know what I think is a pretty good overview on our topics page on the website at, um, uh, of what exactly the Tet Offensive was. But for people who are listening who may not be you know familiar, you know what 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 what's your elevator pitch for what the you know, for the Tet Offensive for the Tet Offensive? Yeah, why should people know about it and what and why is it significant? Okay, in, in short, um, the Tet Offensive refers to a Viet Cong, a North Vietnamese offensive uh, that was launched during the Tet holiday of 1968. Uh, the um, Tet holiday is based, it's an annual event, but it's based on a lunar calendar. So the date changes every year, depending on the, you know, the phases of the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this particular year, the year of the monkey, because um, it's the, you know, the Asian zodiac calendar, the, uh, Tet, uh, the Tet holiday would begin on 30, the night of 30, 31 January. Um, some years it happens as late as the end of February, so it, it moves around. But this year, that's, that's when it was. And it's a, in, in, in many Asian cultures, it's the most important holiday of the year. It's like Christmas and Thanksgiving and you know all the other great holidays rolled into one. It's a time to settle debts, forgive people, um, you know, wish for good luck, and kind of prepare yourself for the coming year. So traditionally, you know, people take off work, go home, spend time with their families. Um, mm -hmm. That was part of the reason the North Vietnamese Viet Cong chose this time. Is so many. South Vietnamese soldiers would be home on leave. And so that, that was a deliberate uh, decision. 
Um, and then was it was that was that expectation was pardon me was that expectation set by um you know historical examples i mean when the when the vietnamese were were fighting the french for example was tet traditionally a time that there wasn't a lot of fighting going on well in fact i mean traditionally if you're really you know going back several centuries i mean yes um by and large it was a it, there was usually a truce observed there was also again long periods of civil war hmm. in in Vietnam back then. But yes, generally speaking, although um, sort of ironically, in late 18th century, um, the Vietnamese did use Tet to attack the French. So there was a precedent, hmm. um, but that had been a long time ago. Um, yeah. For the last few years before 1968, uh, both sides had had observed a several day truce period. During Tet. Okay. So, you know, there, there was a precedent for that, and both sides announced that you know, it would be for this long. Of course, it was it was never no fighting, but it the fighting was very minimal generally. Um, and so yes, that was there was a precedent um, you know, in the 60s. And this is why um in some parts of South Vietnam, up to half of the South Vietnamese troops, in fact, went on leave. Um, so, you know, it was, um, from a, from a communist point of view, it was an ideal time to launch the attacks because there'd be fewer people, certainly South Vietnamese, and of course the Americans, you know, are not going on leave and they're not going anywhere, but, um, the point of the Tet Offensive, uh, and this is the thing that people, um, need to keep in mind, is it was designed to be a knockout blow against the South Vietnamese government. Uh, the Americans were, were secondary. The, the, the communists were going to attack the Americans only if they were in the way, or only if they needed to keep them busy to do the other things. By um, early 1968, this is about three years into the, the American phase of the war, you know, we had our troop strength was, was heading towards half a million. And the war, in many respects, had kind of become a stalemate. And so the leaders in Hanoi, particularly Le Zuan, uh, for those who've seen the Ken Burns documentary, you understand Ho Chi Minh was not really running the show at this point. He was very old, very sick. It was this ideologue named Le Zuan, and he was the one who came up with this idea. Um, we, need to, we need to basically get this situation off of this center balance. You know, we need to start pushing for a victory because if they didn't, they were concerned that you know, the Americans would eventually wear them down. So what do you do? Go for a knockout blow, hit the South Vietnamese government where it hurts, you know, hit their headquarters, hit their officers, hit their command and control facilities, you know, hit the government um, buildings. Uh, and if we do that, you do it quickly, then we can then establish a coalition government. It's still controlled by the communists, but it, it, it appears to be a broad coalition, you know, of nationalists. And then basically say to the Americans, all right, thank you very much, but we can handle it from here. You can go home. That was the point of the Tet Offensive. It was designed to be this knockout blow. And that's why they invaded more than 300 cities, um, you know, during the opening phase. And again, most of the targets were South Vietnamese. They, there was a lot of fighting with the Americans only to kind of, you know, keep them busy while all this stuff went on. So that was, you know, that's, that's what people need to know about the Tet Offensive. Um, and that's why it was such a, a, a huge deal is, you know, this is three years into a war, into the war, American casualties, you know, were, were heading towards 30,000 killed already. Um, There's a lot of war weariness, but there had been progress in 67. I mean, things had been getting better. The President Johnson was making that pitch you know, in late 67, there was an election coming up, wanted to show that things were, you know, heading in the right direction. And when this happens, of course, it comes as a shock to, to many people, you know, at home that you would have, you know, 80,000 communists suddenly emerge from the countryside and, 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 and cities like Saigon and Wei are, are on fire. And so that's, that, that's the important thing for, that people need to know about the Tet Offensive. That's what it was about. Got it. And what... Uh what was the relative what were the relative roles in those uh 300 uh attacks um right what were the relative roles of north vietnamese army versus Viet Cong? 
This, uh, it, it's a good question because um, there are some sort of myths or misunderstandings surrounding this. Uh, that one of the sort of myths of Tet is that the North Vietnamese uh, essentially sacrificed the Viet Cong um, in, in, in the attacks because they didn't want to have to, you know, deal with these Southern communists when they finally took over the entire country. Um, that's not true. You know, from the very beginning, the Viet Cong, and again, the Viet Cong is a, not the official term that they use for themselves. You know, they, they, the Southern insurgents call themselves the People's Liberation Armed Forces. Viet Cong is what the allies called them, it's sort of pejorative term, but everyone uses it, so I'm gonna use it. Um, the North Vietnamese, by contrast, again, these are regular North Vietnamese soldiers from North Vietnam who've come south to fight. And so these two, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese are fighting side by side under the same command structure. Mm. I mean, there's no daylight between them. The people running the show in the South are in fact members of Hanoi's Politburo. I mean, there's you know, about a dozen people who run the show in North Vietnam. And several of those folks, the highest ranking ones are down South controlling the war. So they're, you know, same, same people basically. Mm -hmm. the, but during Tet, um, the basic approach they used was they used the local Viet Cong forces. Again, the people who lived, were from a certain area who knew it really well, used the local Viet Cong forces to infiltrate the cities because in, they knew the terrain, their accents wouldn't give them away because North Vietnamese have different accents. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like someone from from Maine going to Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, and these Viet Cong forces would act as essentially guides. So it'd usually be some combination of a Viet Cong force and a North Vietnamese force working in, in conjunction, mm -hmm. attacking these cities. Um, in, in the really big battles like Saigon, what you had were the, the biggest communist units, the, the regiments and stuff, um, would be fighting on the periphery, fighting the Americans um, in their various bases around Saigon, keeping them busy. And again, all these local force companies actually penetrating um, um, the capital, you know, spreading around and going after targets um, that included um, the South Vietnamese president, uh, the police headquarters, um, the South Vietnamese uh, command, joint general staff, you know, all those places. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about this later. There's one exception to that. Uh, the Viet Cong also attacked the U.S. Embassy, but that was a target that was led, that was added almost at the last moment. And the fact that it was added so late was actually part of the reason it, it didn't work out very well. But by and large, these are again um, local local boys, as you would say, and some women too, um, who were actually doing the initial penetration and, and and showing the North Vietnamese how to get there. In some cases, when these Viet Cong would be killed. <laughs> the North Vietnamese forces would get lost. And, and that happened in some cases. But really, the attack force was balanced. If you're talking 80,000 communists, it was about half and half. Half right. Viet Cong, half for North Vietnamese. Hmm. Hmm. And, you know, as a, as a military tactic, how successful was it overall? There's different ways to look at it. Um, I think... It's, it's, it's absolutely fair to say it was a sort of a remarkable accomplishment uh, given the size of the offensive and the scope of it. The fact that they, and I say they, you know, the communists managed to keep it relatively um, secret uh, from the allies before it began. Now I say relatively because in some places like the Northern part of, the, of, of South Vietnam, near the DMZ in the Central Highlands, the Allies did have some pretty solid intelligence that something was coming. So it wasn't like it was an absolute surprise, um, but no one on the Allied side you know, was able really to put the whole thing together. Now, some people say, well, there's, there's like some analysts, CIA who said, oh, you know, that they actually got it right, that they knew it was coming. N no, not really. Um, they, 
there were certain people who kind of understood the communists had the capability. They certainly knew that, but almost everyone said, yeah, but why would you do that? Because you're going to get creamed. I mean, the communists have spent three years, you know, being very careful about conserving their forces. Mm -hmm. they, almost all the time will only fight when they want, where they want, and as long as they want. And then they, you know, they bug out. Mm -hmm. And that way they can control their losses. If you do this, you know, you're going to expose the cream of your troops to allied firepower. And, and so a lot of people just said, like, yeah, they could do it, but that just seems crazy. So, so, he, so even though such a large proportion of South Vietnamese troops were, you know, taking a holiday for lack of yeah. a better phrase. There was still enough um, firepower that this right. this, this would. And would... again, it, it it varied on the region. the 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 northern part of South Vietnam, uh, the area known as I Corps, you know, Quang Tri, that area, uh, very few South Vietnamese had been given leave because there was a lot of concern that's where the attack would take place. The, the siege at Khe San begins. 11 days before the offensive begins. And uh, Quezon is, and this is another sort of myth of Tet. The, well, Quezon, the siege of Quezon had several objectives, but the communists had in mind as a short-term objective, laying siege to this marine base, which is you know out in Northwestern Quang, in the mountains, um, laying siege to it. There's about 6,000 Marines there and some South Vietnamese Rangers to lay uh, siege to it in order to, as a diversion for Tet. But what most people don't understand is they weren't expecting to pull American reserves away. That's, that's not the case. The Americans had an incredible ability to move troops quickly. I mean, you, can move, you could move a whole brigade in a day or two if you wanted to. So it wasn't that. What they were trying to do and what they partly did was they drew away the South Vietnamese elite troops. The Southeast Army is around 630,000 people at, at this point. But of that total of their divisions and, and everything else, the really, really best troops were six South Vietnamese Marine battalions and nine South Vietnamese Airborne battalions, right? Okay. So those 15 battalions are the only battalions that Saigon, you know, the government can send anywhere in the country and fight anywhere and, and you know, get the job done. I mean, there are other good units, but these are the ones that they can send to the hotspots. Um, by laying siege to Quezon, the communists, in fact, um, convinced the government to send up um, about four or five of these battalions you know, uh, to be off, basically off in the boonies. And the point was, better to have them out at Quezon than in Saigon. Because if you're going to take over the government, you don't want those paratroopers and, and, and Marines in the way. Uh, fortunately for the Allies, the secrecy surrounding the Tet Offensive Plan was, was so great that the communists kind of shot themselves in the foot. Right? So they say they've been thinking and preparing and playing you know, for months and months and months. But the Politburo, the leaders in Hanoi, didn't actually come to a decision on when it would start until 14 January. That's two weeks before the battle begins. So they didn't even amongst themselves decide when it would begin. And they decided, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to alert our senior commanders in the South just between you know, 48 or 72 hours ahead of time. So like, you know, on the eve of Tet, if the average communist soldier in South Vietnam had no clue that anything was coming. I mean, they, you know, they'd been told by their officers, you know, celebrate Tet early, make sure you, you, know, you have your equipment, be ready to go if something happens. But you know, if they didn't know, if they get captured, they, they'd spill it. So only a few senior people in the South knew that this even was going to happen, and they didn't know when. So when Hanoi sent the encrypted message a couple of days beforehand, 
they made the unfortunate decision to use a phrase, the offensive will begin between the first and second days of Tet. That's translation, basically. Mm -hmm. And so they sat back and waited for things to happen. Just about 36 hours before it was all began, someone somewhere figured out, we have a problem, Houston. The calendar that they use in the North was different than the calendar they use in the South. No kidding. So it was off by one day. So what, what they realize is that these, you know, that the commanders in the South are going to get confused about when to do it. So they, they send an order, hey, stop, 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 stop. You know, we really mean such and such a time. Mm -hmm. So the order gets out to some of the troops, but not all. So in the middle part of South Vietnam, the commanders didn't have time to pull them back. Because, you know, the Central, uh, Central Highlands, they've gone radio silent, you know. So the attacks actually begin on the 9th, 29th, 30th. So this gives Saigon and the Allies one day of warning, mm. right? And as a result of that, for example, there was a South Vietnamese Airborne Battalion that was at Tan San big air base, Saigon, and it was getting ready to be flown to Quezon. And when this early attack happened, you're like, whoa, stop. We think you guys better stick around for a little bit. And that turned out to be a very good idea because those that airborne battalion proved to be crucial in you know defeating the Viet Cong attack on the city. So again, one of those big oopsies. Uh, I mean, again, you, you managed to pull it offensive with a great deal of, of surprise, but in doing so, you know, a lot of units again get the word too late. I mean, in one case, there's post-war accounts of this one Viet Cong commander who, 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 you know, races down to, you know, his subordinate commanders to let him know. And he's looking around and his subordinate commander is gone. He decided to go off and, you know, see his family. So he's not even there. And, and he goes, he finds a second in command. The guy's drunk off his keister. Right, so it's like, oh, wait a minute. We're supposed to be attacking in like, you know, 12 hours. So there was a lot of confusion that also went along with this. And in some cases, again, units got lost um, or just attacked whatever target was available instead of the one they were supposed to. Hmm. Yeah. Got it, got it. So this was, uh, you mentioned uh, Saigon and Wei, you know, um, provincial capitals were targets mm -hmm. um was this uh was this the first time that there had been significant fighting in the streets of those major cities yes uh there had been um a sort of you know a steady trickle of what you i guess you'd call terrorist attacks in cities like saigon and way the occasional mortar attack you know those sorts of things um, but no major ground attack on this scale before. A couple of the, 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 you know, regional capitals, the provincial capitals or district capitals way on the periphery, you know, had been attacked and in some cases overrun before. But those are the ones, you know, way up at the border with, you know, Cambodia and Laos, very hard to defend. These mm -hmm. big cities, you know, Saigon had over 2 million people in its, you know, in its gr greater area. And that's, you know, out of a country of 16 million, uh, you know, weighs 100,000 plus Da Nang's even bigger. Um, so those cities really had not seen this kind of ground fighting before. And the communists had not tried because, you know, once you get in there, it's awfully tough to get out. And in fact, most of the, uh, virtually all the attacking units had not been given orders for withdrawal. Usually the communists are meticulous in planning. They spend you know weeks or sometimes months preparing, positioning supplies, instructing their leaders, figuring out which way to come in, which way to go out, all that. This was the first time that they'd never been given a plan on how to get out. Um, this was partly because in order to sort of get them all pumped up, for this big push, the political officers in VC and NVA were basically telling the rank and file soldiers, this is the war winning offensive. Mm. You know, this is it, you know, one and done. We're gonna go in here, we're gonna smash and grab, you know, governmental collapse and 
you know, we'll, we'll win the war basically. Uh, so you don't really want to be putting in their minds, yeah, but if things go badly, here's what we'll do. No, it's a, you know, all or nothing type of pitch they're making. Uh, now, of course, when things go pear-shaped as they did, um, you improvise. So, you know, these communist units, um, you know, usually figure a way to get out. Um, some of them were nearly annihilated. Um, there's like, there was this one local force, the sixth um, local force uh, battalion, for example, that, that attacks Saigon. And it comes in with about 300 people. And it stays in the city. And actually, you know, they, they send in more replacements from the countryside. So they probably send in another two or 300. And so out of that 630 escape. <laughs> so that's significant casualties, I think you could say. So in some cases, you know, these, these units were really just smashed. Uh, in other cases, um, you know, heavy casualties, but they, you know, pulled back in good order. Um, it, it, like I said, it, it just kind of depended on, on the time and place. Casualties at the end of this, it's a five week offensive. Out of the, so the original attacking force of 80 some thousand, and then they fed in another 40 or so during the coming weeks. So out of all that, estimates are upwards of 40,000 were killed. A third. Or incapacitated. I mean, that's like a third. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, it's, it's astronomical. Uh, now, some of those, I mean, I would say about maybe 20% of the 15, 20% of those that were killed or incapacitated um, were, in fact, um, sort of Shanghai. Like, so right before Tet, a lot of Viet Cong units would press people into service women and men and stuff for the offensive. And usually they'd say, okay, you're gonna carry ammunition or you're gonna be a stretcher bearer. And of course, a lot of those folks got killed. So, you know, depending on how you look at it, you know, were they Viet Cong? Well, I mean, yeah, they were fighting for the Viet Cong, but they just weren't necessarily, I mean, they weren't like, you know, regular soldiers. Um, and so some of those folks, you know, paid the price. Yeah. Yeah, well, aside from the numbers, right, and that's staggering to think, you know, a, you, mm -hmm. a third of your forces are wiped out in this effort. Um, but if you just look at what the objective was, as you described it, right? Uh, if the objective was to destabilize or collapse the South Vietnamese government, it it didn't work. It did not. It did not so, work. So mm -hmm. militarily, you could describe it. You know, one could describe it as a failure, and yet the 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 dominoes that followed, particularly yeah. stateside um didn't necessarily reflect that as a you know a, a great moment for us in the war right and and this is i think this is probably the central de point of debate about the Tet offensive if there's anything it's you know was it a turning point was it a in fact a catastrophic military defeat for the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese or um was it in fact a great political victory for them because of the way it was portrayed, you know, yeah, in the American yeah. media and things like that. Um, right. So I should if there's point a... out that the 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 attacks that take place were supposed to coincide with what they call a general uprising, you know. So the, theoretically, hundreds of thousands of people would come out and support the Viet Cong, and, and that never happened. So you know, on the surface of it, you're, if you're doing a balance sheet, yes, the communists took horrendous losses. The general uprising did not take place. Uh, the South Vietnamese government did not fall. And, you know, it was hard pressed in certain locations, but it actually comes out not right away, but later it comes out stronger. So in all those ways, yes. Um, but why is it that I think your average American, if they know anything, you know, think, thinks of Ted as the turning point, as a battle that set us on the path to leaving the war. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's different ways to address that. I, you know, one that, you know, I think comes to mind, people might know is the story of Walter Cronkite. Uh, for the youngins who don't know Walter Cronkite, 
uh, he was a you know longtime CBS news anchor and journalist. And uh, he goes to Vietnam during the Tet Offensive to do reporting on the ground. So, and he particularly goes to the city of Way. And, and the Battle of Way lasted for over four weeks, uh, which was unusual. In most cases, the offensive this, it was over in a couple of days. But uh, the communists got into Way, which is a big walled citadel, and hung on for until the end of February, pretty much. Uh, so he goes there, some of the toughest fighting in the war, um, talks with senior commanders um, and comes back and then does this short editorial on television, 27 February, 1968. And again, he's saying, you know, this, this, is, this is my impression. This is, this is what I saw and this is my opinion. And, and so he, you know, he gives this relatively brief summation of where he thinks things stand. Um, and I think it's really worth spending a moment to listen, you know, or to read what he said. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the years since then, a lot of folks have pointed to that moment and said, ah, you know, he, here's a moment where, you know, the media, in this case, Walter Cronkite, you know, CBS News, had a decisive impact. On, on our policy, you know, on our direction of the war and, and how we perceive the Tet Offensive. So, uh, you know, again, and I think, you know, I'm sure you'll provide, you know, links and a clip and a place to be able to, to listen literally to what he said or read the transcript. Um, but it's important to do that because again, in popular memory, I think a lot of people have come to believe that what Walter Cronkite said was that, you know, Tet was a defeat, that, you know, we couldn't win the war, that, you know, we just need to get out. And that's not actually what he said. And so it's worth actually listening. And, and the, the, the crux of his argument is, you know, I, having seen all that I've seen, having followed this war, you know, I can come to no other conclusion that we are in a stalemate. There is no, you know, uh, likely scenario that I can imagine where the United States will be defeated militarily. So that's, you know, that, that's not going to happen. But at the same time, he says, I can also not see a path forward where we can win the war decisively, you know, in a sort of World War II style way at a reasonable time and at a reasonable cost. And so he says, you know, at reasonable, the end of the cost, day, I think, reasonable cost in terms of all resources of lives lives money, money right. destruction prestige you know all those things so he said you know the, 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 he said pro, you know what will need to happen is this war will have to come to some kind of negotiated conclusion you know that, that he said that's that's that that's we're not we're not going to just win it you know uh world war ii style it's mm -hmm. going to have to be some process of negotiation because otherwise it would just go on forever and he was right i mean he was absolutely right and and, and if if you take anything you know away from this and, and i need to emphasize this because i've spent 22 years studying this i've read you know hundreds of thousands of pages of you know from the americans and the south vietnamese and the communists and you know everything else the leaders in Hanoi were never going to give up. They were never, ever going to give up. They were not defeated after Tet, despite losing 40,000. The fact is their armies in the South were not destroyed. They were still capable of continuing the war. And indeed, in May, they come back and launch a second general offensive. And then they do it again in August. So. There was never any point where the, the leaders in Illinois said, oh my gosh, you know, that was a, a huge error. You know, if they just push us a little harder, we're going to throw in the towel. No, it was never, ever, ever going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, losing, you know, a third of your forces would be considered by a lot of military commanders as catastrophic. Right. But if you, you know, if you're, 
if you are in charge of an authoritarian state, which it was, and you have, you know, the ability to send tens of thousands of fresh bodies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail every month, which they did, and given the size of North Vietnam and their, their, their sort of, you know, population, it was enough to sustain even this level of fighting for years and years. So, hmm. you know, yeah, it, it, then that, they were prepared to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I want to come back to the Walter Cronkite uh, yeah. co commentary because I think that part of the, part of the popular narrative, uh, you know, the, the widely accepted narrative about Tet was that that, that commentary. I mean, he was he was not just the the CBS news anchor. He was the news anchor of mm -hmm. the time. Uh, I I can't even tell you who the news anchors were at the other two major right. <laughs> broadcasting right. corporations. So, so Walter Cronkite was was it. And uh, you know, part of that part of that narrative is that you know that that commentary from Walter Cron Cronkite marked a turning point in popular support for the war. How much of that popular narrative do you think, from a historical perspective, how much of that popular uh, popular narrative is, do we have right? And what are some of the key things we have wrong about that? Yeah, it's, it's on the whole, it's wrong. Um, so, you know, popular support for the war had been declining, you know, ever since the United States sent in conventional troops you know, March of 65. It had been on a, you know, sort of gradual downslope. Um, and when the Tet Offensive begins, there's actually a surge in public support for Johnson, the administration. There's sort of a rally around the flag effect that, that, that usually happens. So again, that actually spikes up in February. Um, and the you know, the downward trend, you know, only begins to happen towards the end of the month, but again, not in a precipitous way. Um, and when President Johnson makes the announcement, you know, at the beginning of March that he's not gonna seek reelection, that he's gonna, you know, devote all of his, his energy to, 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 to seeking a peace, again, his, his, his actually ratings go up again. Um, it's not until the summer, late summer of 68, that the, the numbers really begin to kind of drop, drop off a cliff. So the general feeling, really, the, the, the truth of it is support, you know, was not strong at that point. But during that period, it actually goes up. And I think there's a feeling like, okay, you know, we're not going to, you know, we, we're going to rally around the flag. Um, let's, you know, let's not simply throw in the towel. And again, of, of those people who didn't support the war, again, keep in mind some of it's not that they wanted to leave, it's they wanted to fight it harder. You know, they wanted to, to just carpet bomb North Vietnam or, or new, use nuclear weapons or whatever. So, you know, you have to kind of dig in there, but, but as far as a sort of public opinion turning point, it's, it's not really the case. Um, Having said that, um, I think it's also true that now that someone with the stature of a Walter Cronkite had s said that, you know, openly, I think there, there's there's a fair argument to be made that in in some sense he he did kind of mainstream, you know, the a kind of middle America debate about the war you know it wasn't just the hippies and the kids trying to avoid the draft you know marching in the streets it was kind of a more of a national conversation like what are we what are we doing here what what, what do we expect how long will it take you know so i think that's kind of what he does is he he, he broadens the debate um because this is guy people need to understand walter cronkite was no lefty pinko Okay, he got his start as a war correspondent in World War II. He landed with American troops in North Africa in 1942. He flew in a B-17 bombing raid in February of 43 before they had adequate fire, fighter cover 
over Germany. In fact, fired a machine gun at, at a German aircraft that was attacking. Okay. Andy Rooney, by the way, is another journalist who flew on the same mission. Who's that? The guy from 60 Minutes. Um, almost as, as dangerous as that, he landed in a glider during Operation Market Garden in Holland in 1944. Just landing in a glider is, is dangerous enough. You know, it's a terrifying experience. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, this is a guy who's, who, who understood the military. Incidentally, it was during the Battle of the Bulge that he, he gets to know and becomes friends with a young tanker named Creighton Abrams, one of the guys who broke through the Bastogne siege. And then, of course, Creighton, Creighton Abrams in early 1968 is a second unit command under West Marlin. So when Cronkite goes over there in February, that's when he, he, he sits down with Abrams, who's been there for almost a year now or nine months. Mm -hmm. and says, you know, Abe, you know, what's going on here? I mean, you know, they have a very long discussion, you know. So it's not like he's just some, you know, East Coast liberal latte guy who comes, you know, in for a photo op. Uh, no, 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 no. This is, this is, he's a Missouri guy who was raised in Texas. He's a war correspondent. He was picked by, handpicked by Edward R. Murrow to be his successor at CBS. He had the street cred. Mm. So when he said this stuff, you know, I think, you know, people are like, okay, yeah, this isn't Abby Hoffman. This isn't some wild haired, you know, leftist who's screaming about, you know, taking down the man. He is the man. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think, yes, I mean, it, it, it allowed a, conversa a, a bigger conversation to happen, but it wasn't like the turning point. And also as far as the story of, you know, allegedly, um, President Johnson, you know, after this editorial, you know, turned to his advisor and said, oh, my God, you know, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, I've lost middle America. That may or may not have happened. Um, different people tell different stories. But the point is, President Johnson had already decided he, he wasn't going to run for re-election. It wasn't like he was like, oh, my gosh, Cronkite, that's it. I'm out of here. No, he, back in December, he privately told General Westmoreland he wasn't going to run again. Right. Because his health was failing and, you know, he really needed to focus on peace. He was like, you know, I want, you know, Humphrey, my vice president, to take over. And so it, it didn't like that. That wasn't the thing that changed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we've got, <clears throat> if maybe we're putting, uh, you know, an undue amount of weight on that yeah. commentary as a turning point. It's still true that whatever led to the kind of what you described as falling off a cliff of popular mm -hmm. support, uh, that all did happen in the context of Cronkite having said what he said. So he may yeah, not yeah, have been was, the turning yeah, point, yeah, but he was, should, he was up, upstream. Right, we should not it. dismiss uh, the, the, the significance of what he did, but it was not in itself the thing that triggered that, you know, that, that, that pulled out the rug, for example. I mean, sure. there've been a lot of studies about the influence of the media. I think in a way that's kind of one of the enduring debates about the Vietnam War. You know, some people yeah. have come yeah. to the conclusion that, you know, the media um, undercut the American military national foreign policy position by selectively or deceptively or whatever, you know, reporting uh, and, and Ted is usually sort of held up as the, you know, the, the kind of crowning moment of that. Um, I disagree. Uh, other knowledgeable people disagree. Um, and I think um, it's worth quoting in, in particular, I'm gonna, and I, I, pulled it, I pulled it aside because I, uh, I thought it was brilliant. There was a, a journalist um, named Don Oberdorfer who, um, went on a few years later to write sort of the first and in many ways still one of the great books on the Tet Offensive. But speaking in 1978, uh, this is what he said. He said, if Ted had been reported only in newspaper stories and radio dispatches, I doubt that the offensive would have had the effect that it did. And I think that's important because a takeaway point of all of this isn't that the media put their thumb on the scale. I, 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 don't, I don't believe it did. I've read all the contemporary reporting. I've seen all the coverage. But 
when you are seeing nightly images of, you know, burning cities and, you know, American bodies in, you know, Vietnamese bodies in the streets and the, the sort of the apparent chaos, that has a powerful effect. And, and, and the thing that he, the sort of his follow-on point, I think this is very profound, Oberdorfer believes that Tet was, and I'm, I'm quoting here, the first true life big event in which television played a catalytic role in changing people's thinking and behavior on matters of national and international policy. So what does he mean? And I think this is, this is why it's relevant to our day now. I think he's right. I think the Tet Offensive was the first time where because of television, there was this sort of national fixation on this story, this evolving story, right? Which, which had an impact, you know, that still rever reverberates. Now we, again, we live in an era where like the O.J. Simpson chase, right? You're watching it live. Everyone is, you know, or Twitter, you know, you up to the moment, you know, what is happening. We're used to those kinds of big event stories now, right? Um, where people just get kind of hooked on this drama. I think Ted was really the first time that happened. Mm. I mean, the only other antecedent is the Cuban Missile Crisis, but that's different because that was... You know that was so it was too esoteric mm -hmm. um they, they, we hadn't lost anybody um it didn't have the same it has sort of cerebral drama but you know but, but not like you know blood burning buildings right? yeah and i think yeah. tet in a lot of ways you know really was kind of the first time and why even now sort of the enduring images are you know the certain those certain visual um snapshots you know like the famous Eddie Adams photo of General Luan executing that, you know, Viet Cong prisoner in Saigon. You know, th those are the enduring images yeah. um, that we and have. Then you, and then you add to those images the numbers, right? Like when you're right. standing at this, when you're standing at the wall and you look at the yep. amount, the, the, the real estate of that wall that is, mm -hmm. that is 1968. Right. It's, right. And, it's and, significant. and, you know, the, that was, that was the, 31st of January really was was the highest single casualty rate killed in action of the entire war of, you know, upwards of, you know, 270 or something, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood um, on a single day. So, yeah, absolutely. So you got this combination was, of moving images in your living right. room and, you know, staggering numbers of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, kind of what people had been used to seeing in terms of American yeah. losses. Yeah. And I think uh, even up to that point, a lot of folks, it's my impression, you know, having talked with a lot of people, I, like my, my parents lived through it. Um, they weren't following it obsessively day by day. I mean, you know, it, it was a story like with a lot of other stories and occasionally something dramatic might sort of rise up. But, uh, you know, by and large, people were kind of getting on with their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly here you have, again, this sort of, you know, in, in capital letters, big event that just sort of saturates, you know, the, the information sphere. And you kind of can't get away from it. And then so you kind of have to deal with it and talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like when Kanye changed his name to Ye. That you was, know, big, you get, big events like that. You couldn't get away Everyone remembers where they were when they heard that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, so um, I think I, I think I sidetracked you. You were when I when I when I interjected about the numbers, right? Being, oh, yeah, yeah. but but you were on your way to making a what I thought was a really interesting point, which is how the media coverage of Tet became sort of the grandfather for how media coverage still works and that dynamic between the media and the military. Right, and I think it, it, it isn't. You know, I don't think it's fully appreciated that, you know, so much of, of these things, you know, are, are, are driven by advances in technology, right? You know, by 1968, um, you know, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but, but I, I think, you know, most of, first off, obviously, the vast majority of American homes have a TV. And by 68, it's also color television, right? 62, mostly black and white, 68. You know, you've got color television. Um, 
By 68, you also have a, a rudimentary satellite network where people in Vietnam can actually send back images and video you know, through these links without having to send an actual canister. So the turnaround time is faster. Um, and, and so, you know, this is sort of, uh, you know, a moment where you say, well, okay, this is, you know, the power of television is, is, is really, you know, becoming obvious. Now we live in an era where social media is the 800 pound gorilla. And again, I don't think we've fully, you know, come to understand all of its effects, but, you know, if you're looking at, you know, the last 10 years of American history, I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, it, it has had a huge effect. Um, so part of it isn't a matter of, you know, bias per se, it's just, it's when you have an evolving information um, environment and new things come along, sometimes you're not, you're not aware of how powerful those things are until a big event happens. Mm -hmm. And suddenly everyone is on their phone, you know, watching Twitter, you know, for the latest updates or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think in a way, this is, you know, this is a moment where, you know, for color television, you could say, you know, uh, shows its, its real uh, influence. Yeah, yeah. For the first time, it's, it's, it's vivid, it's mm -hmm. immediate, and it's in your living room every night. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, you were talking about that. You were talking about the Eddie Adams photo. Um, right. For people who aren't familiar with that, can you talk a little bit about the photo and then the mythology sure. around the photo? Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's, you know, in addition to the Cronkite moment, that's, you know, probably another one of those sort of, um, you know, pivotal, you know, moments that, that has endured. The photo shows a uh, helmetless South Vietnamese officer wearing a flak jacket, sending his arm with 38 pistol. And at the moment where he's uh, killing a Viet Cong um, prisoner who's you know, wearing a flannel vest, short pants, and he's got his you know, arms tied behind his back. So mm -hmm. Eddie Adams photographer captures that moment. Um, it, the fact is there are actually, there were actually at least four or five cameramen around, uh, you know, them when this happened, there's actually, there's actually live footage too. I think NBC, Howard Tucker did a story the next night where they actually show the, the film. Um, so it's become against an you know, iconic image, not just of Tet, but of the war. And I think because of the power, because it is such an arresting image. Um, I mean, it, 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 it sparked discussion and controversy right from the beginning. And I think the story that most people know about it now, if they know anything, again, and I've done a lot of research on this, probably goes something like this. Um, the backstory is, allegedly, that this Viet Cong guy uh, was a guy named Bailop. It's an alias, but he's allegedly the head of the Saigon Commando Force that carried out a lot of these attacks. And he just recently had murdered almost the entire family of a South Vietnamese officer who was Luan's friend. Luan was you know, the godfather of these children. So when they apprehended this guy, um, and again, by some accounts with blood on his pants, you know, and gloating about it, um, Luan, kills him, you know, in, in, in retribution, basically. That, that's, that's the story, I think, that has become dominated the narrative. That's what most people think. Because initially it was, oh my God, wait a minute, these are our allies? Yeah, the South Vietnam, he's the head of the South Vietnamese police force and he's, he's, he's executing, executing people in the people streets. People in the streets. Right. And so there was like, and then so the counter narrative being, oh, but you don't know the backstory. Now, you know, this guy, Bailop, he was a bad guy and blah, blah, blah. Um, none of that is true. Well, not none, uh, virtually none of, none of that. that is. None virtually of that none of that is true. Okay, so because this story is, has obsessed me forever. Because I, you know, if you're in this game a while and you, you start to like 
really just soak in it, you get your little spidey senses, right? If something just doesn't seem right. And I, it just, you know, having seen the sequence of photos leading up to this, and then that one, it just, it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. So I have, you know, done all this research and um, I think come up with the, what I think is a very compelling um, explanation. It's, it's quite different and I think in own way quite interesting. And I should say I'm actually working with a filmmaker on this. And, and so there's a documentary that will come out eventually. But the real story is this. This guy um, was not Baylop. Uh, Baylop, again, an alias, it means seven tires. All, all the Viet Cong had aliases. It'd be like brother four or, or uncle six or something. Um, Baylop was killed the day before in another part of town. We know this because the communists themselves say it. he was killed at the Navy Yard. I mean, it wasn't him. Second of all, one of the things that bugged me was, I, you know, I know the Viet Cong sapper unit. Uh, these guys were more like um, surveillance and intelligence folks, not like your, you know, naked loincloth sapper with explosives. I mean, they're more like sort of dime star James Bonds. Right? Where does this term sapper come from? Sapper um, is, is actually, you know, predates the war, but sapper refers to um, what you might think of as a sort of specialized combat engineer, a soldier who was trained to infiltrate and destroy objectives using explosives okay. or some other, you know, um, like special device. So rather than you know just sort of charging as an infantryman, they're they're the ones that sneak in, mm -hmm. plant explosives or clear bob wire or whatever. Okay. Um, so that's that that's the general term. It, it's actually more accurate to call these particular folks um, urban operatives. But whatever. The point is. These sappers in Saigon, they had a, spe a very specific role. Um, in during Tet, every single one of them, I mean, believe me, they cleared out the headquarters. All, like, you know, most of them were out in the field doing something. They these were the ones who were supposed to, for example, break into the South Vietnamese presidential palace, um, infiltrate the national headquarters, the South Vietnamese command post, you know, all these important government installations and the embassy, by the way. Um, so they had a very specific role, which again was to, you know, break into places and hold them just long enough until reinforcements came. And so the people who broke in the U.S. Embassy, there are 15 of them, by the way, not 19, as people say, although there were two embassy drivers who may have been undercover agents. When they broke through the outer compound wall, their purpose was not to actually get into the main building and destroy it or anything else. The, their point was, we're going to break through the outer wall and hold the grounds long enough for a couple hundred university students to come and stage a sit-down strike. I told you about this general uprising concept. Mm -hmm. That was what, That's what they're thinking, gotcha. is let's get the students to come in, and then they, they won't shoot at us. Right. Of course, they don't show up, and things go pear-shaped. Three of them live, by the way. So we have their interrogation reports. We know the planning. Um, and so, you know, we know what they were, what they were thinking, the, but the point is these sappers were not assassins. The, the communist party committee in Saigon did have folks who did that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were called the security agents that, you know, T4 security agents, they were hitmen, out and out hitmen. And, and they did, they did assassinate officials, no question. They were totally different people, different missions. So when I'm looking about, at this guy something about photos, this guy in the photo and you're thinking that's yeah, I'm looking not... at this guy in the photo with the with the with the the short pants and mm. you know the flannel shirt and he's he, he was carrying just one sort of tiny soviet pistol I'm like this is all wrong mm -hmm. all the sappers were dressed like uh, office workers mm. you know they're carrying ak's and rocket i'm looking at this guy going you know what this guy is he's a, he's he's a runner he's a liaison probably. why is he wearing shorts who wears shirts in Vietnamese society in, in the city, unless you're, you know, a child, rickshaw drivers, bicycle, people who were get around. And sure enough, I found an account from a South Vietnamese Marine who was there at the time. And there was this pagoda, the Hong Kong pagoda that had been surrounded. Apparently this guy, his real name is Na, comes flying out the side door and tries to jump on a bike. 
these Marines tackle him, you know, tie his hands behind his, you know, his, his, his arms behind his, you know, body, and then march him down the street, like one block. Now, if you see these photos, you'll see, you know, the Marines are, you know, kind of, you know, talking in his ear, and this guy doesn't say a word. There's a pistol he's carrying, it's a piece of paper, and there's an armband. And this armband has a identification code for that sixth local force battalion. I told you they got wiped out. So that's that's the that was another clue. I'm like, wait a minute, that's that's not a sapper. So they march him down the street. Luan is standing there in the middle of the road. Again, no helmet on. They walk up. Luan just glances up and down. You know, sees what he looks like. Pulls out his pistol. Bang. He had no clue who this guy was. But that was the point. He was a nobody. He, you know, he was just, and in fact, he, we now know he was just a, he was a political operative. So he was VC. Yes, he was. Absolutely. Yes, he was armed. Yes, he was not in uniform. But zero evidence that he assassinated anybody. Certainly not this family that gets talked about. Those people who were, in fact, murdered, although one son survived and is now a U.S. admiral, US, yes, uh, yes, US Navy Admiral. Um, that family was murdered way across town, uh, actually outside of Saigon itself by mm. different people. So, mm. yeah, that happened, but it wasn't Bay Lop and it wasn't this guy. Got it. So, what does that all come down to? Well, so what it all comes down to is, you know, the power of the image, right? It is. It's an incredibly powerful image, but you can read into it a lot if you kind of don't know what you're looking at. But and knowing so that backstory, this, knowing, you know, knowing, picture yeah. and say, here we go. Guy had it coming. Doesn't matter that, you know, he didn't get a trial or whatever. You know, bad guy, you know, might as well have shot him. And my position, well, okay, I mean, you, you know, I'm not arguing the legality of it, but I'm just saying, the person that people think he is, that wasn't him. And he probably didn't do what they said he did. Right. But knowing that backstory doesn't, yeah. doesn't uh, diminish what I think the, you know, when you talk about the power of that image, right. right. It, made, exactly. it made, it made people say, well, wait a second, if this is the way our allies are behaving, do we want to be aligned with, sure. with these sure. people knowing that backstory doesn't diminish that at all. It's still no, not a man, at all. And, still and that's a man the thing. executing yeah. a kid in the street. Yeah, and you know, and I'm not, I'm not taking the position that oh, because he wasn't bail up or because he didn't murder the family that, that you know he was innocent or something. I'm not even arguing the legality. I'm just saying it's kind of it's important to know you know the real story behind it because if you don't care about that, I think you're on a slippery slope. If you're if you, you then you can try to get, take the opinion of okay, well we've got someone in death row and okay maybe he didn't do it, but I'm sure he did something. So you might as well kill him. I mean, you, you, you're going that direction, right? And and I think you don't want to go that direction. I think you 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 do want to you want to have an honest discussion about what's going on. Again, my feeling is Luan did this again very deliberately because then there, there were four or five cameramen around. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was making a statement. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't like, oh, this guy's a bad guy, and then he did it. No, it's boom, you're dead because I want everyone to see your body laying in the street. I'm telling you, I'm the sheriff, right? And I also think this, if you want to hear a backstory, just very quickly, the pagoda this guy came from, I think that's, that's part of the reason the one shot him is, it's Anquang Pagoda, this Buddhist pagoda, had been one of the biggest sort of um, uh, Buddhist groups uh, that had been sort of resisting the government. They didn't support the Viet Cong, be very clear about that, but they, they, um, you know, were basically agitating for, you know, more representation and some kind of just peace. Okay. And Luan had actually brokered a, a political settlement with these guys just a few months ago. And so when this joker shows up trying to stir up trouble at the Anquang Pagoda, I think that's part of the reason Luan was like, oh, heck no. Mm -hmm. Bang. Right? Because... He's 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 talking to his citizens. He's not thinking about what the Americans. I mean, 
And this is probably not the only time he did it. This right. is the only time he's on. Right. So, you know, just worth it. Under, it's, it's about a media literacy in a sense. This is my pitch to people. Whenever you see something, it could be a meme, it could be a Facebook story, it could be a photo, whatever. Just take a moment and ask yourself, what is this really about? Am I understanding this correctly? Uh, just take a moment to do, do a little checking because again, at first glance, it may give you a very different story than what's really going on. Mm. Yeah, and the the speed at which these images fly around now. When right. was the when was the uh, Eddie Adams photo? What, what was the date that Americans first uh, the saw first, that? Image? It was a uh, second day of offensive in Saigon, so it was the first of February, and it was um, in the center of the city, District Five, about a block away from the Angkwang Pagoda. Right, but when would Americans have seen it? Oh, they they would well they would have seen um, the next day. Um, for example, I, I there's a New York Times. Um, story um, that that comes out, you know, that morning, showing the photo. Got it. Um, I also have a from the Associated Press. Yeah, and I have a, a supposition that that was a, a part of the reason this subsequent confusion happened because um, the, the the photo b beneath it shows a South Vietnamese soldier carrying a dead child, and so I think that's part of the reason the two, you know it became conflated, right? Mm -hmm. The people saw them together and they sort of began associating them with the same act. Something similar happened during the, uh, after the Battle of Hamburger Hill in 1969. I think Time ran a story. They, they basically said, these are, you know, 400 and some odd Americans that were killed this week. But because they ran that graphic next to the Hamburger Hill story, some people came to the conclusion that 453 American soldiers had died on Hamburger Hill. Mm, mm -hmm. And I've heard that story, you know, since. So I, I think that's that's part of it. But yes, it would have come out the next day. And Howard Tucker did his story on NBC that evening where he actually showed the video. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So um you know, if we were to connect the dots between, you know, those kinds of seminal news reports, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, ones that were vivid and immediate and, uh, you know, and had big numbers behind them in terms right. of American losses. Um, if we were to connect that to how we look at coverage of our military today, mm -hmm. You know, what do you think are the through lines there? And I, you know, obviously we have to talk about Joe Galloway in that context, right, but, right. but yeah, more, bro that's, more, that's... more broadly, what do you think are the, uh, you know, for lack, forgive me for the, you know, uh, the echoes, what are the echoes right. of that? Yeah, well, today? certainly Vietnam War, you know, is, is, is echoed in so many ways, you know, in our society. And that's, it's, it's definitely one of them. I think it's probably fair to say that, you know, following Ted and things like, you know, Milai Massacre, um, which again happened in March, wasn't was not a part of Tet per se, and was revealed, you know, in '69. Um, I think that for you know a long time after the Vietnam War, there was a real mistrust, for example, between the military and the media. Uh, that 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 suspicion lingered for a very very long time, particularly. I mean, it went out, you know, honestly, goes sort of both directions um, and, and can be exacerbated by the fact that if you're, for example, a journalist who's not particularly con conversant with the military or how they operate, then I think it is a lot harder to kind of, you know, see things from that point of view and understand what it, what it means to do an operation or this or the other thing. And by the same token, military folks can be very, very frustrated with, with, with journalists like that and, and just not want to talk to them. I mean, I remember I was in, I was in Kandahar province, Afghanistan, 2010, when uh, Secretary of Defense Gates came for a visit where I was, and he came with a whole gaggle of reporters. And they, you know, after the, the conference, they sort of spread out and 
started, you know, asking questions and a couple of them cornered me and they're like, you know, they're asking like, well, what's a battalion? And I'm like, oh my, you know, what? So, you know, something is, is simple. So I'm like, okay, I, you know, I, I, I get it. I get it. Um, so that distrust, I think, you know, endured for a very long time. And Joe Galloway, who you know, we know, was a UP reporter, uh, very famously, you know, with Battle Yaw Drang. Um, but, you know, he was covered, you know, most of the war after that. Um, he, and then later wrote a book with, you know, Colonel Hal Moore, you know, we were soldiers once young. Um, he was deeply, deeply affected by the war. Um, and, and after, you know, when it was done and he continued to work, I mean, right through the Gulf War, um, he devoted a lot of his efforts in, in ways that weren't always obvious, but a lot of his efforts to repairing that breach because he understood like, like a few others, how dangerous that was to our democracy. And here's a guy, again, a Texan, right. Who, you know, was a plain speaking type of guy, um, had, been in the field with soldiers, shared their hardships, understood the military, but also wasn't some court stenographer. He wasn't just a shill for any government or any military. He told it like it was. He wanted to help heal that breach. And so he worked very hard for many years and, and was instrumental in creating the embedded journalist or embedded media program with the military. So that, you know, by the time of the Gulf War, and particularly the second time around, you know, in, in, in 2001, 2003, uh, the military um, was prepared and in some degree, you know, very happy to have the media, you know, with them because they understood the importance of, you know, getting the story out. Now, there's always going to be tension, right? Um, the military, you know, has its mission to perform and, you know, media out there is a liability or, you know, you don't want to get those people killed. Um, and sometimes things go wrong, right? Um, and it can be embarrassing, but the fact is, you know, I think we have now come to a point where that relationship is, 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 is far, far better than it was after Vietnam. And Joe is a huge part of, of making that happen. So, but I just don't think to be, be a perfect balance, but but I think it's 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 vital that that the media, as a, as the fourth estate, plays its role as an independent voice to inform the American public. Right, right. I mean, the challenge is, you know, if you're you were talking about the gaggle that was uh, mm -hmm. that the, the folks who came up to you and said, "What is a battalion?" Yeah. Right. These are probably not the reporters who are going who are embedded. No, although although um, in, you know, in the case of like 2003, you know, the in, invasion of Iraq, I think it's 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 true to say that they were, you know, a fair number of journalists who really didn't have a lot of experience, you know, as war correspondents. Right. Who, you know, who raised their hand, said, yeah, I want to be part of this. And so they you know had to kind of get smart about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as honestly, you know, any any good journalist worth of salt, you know, is going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to, you know, figure that out if, they, if that's going to be their beat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a very good friend of mine, Don North, who was a um, reporter for ABC. He was actually at the embassy during the attack on a street corner reporting while it was going on. Fortunately, he passed a few years ago. Dear man. But, um, Sorry, you're, you're talking about the embassy in Saigon. Yeah, it's in 1968. Yeah, yeah. This it. is, you know, one of those guys who didn't have a military, he's a Canadian, he didn't have a military background himself, not that Canadians don't have military backgrounds, but in, in his, his case, you know, he never thought of him as a war correspondent, but he went to Vietnam and did spectacular reporting and learned the trade, you know, and so, you know, Don sets a, a great example um, that you don't necessarily... I'm an army employee, but I'm not a army green suitor. But I feel like I have a foot in both worlds, and so I think um, I think it's possible to 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 understand where both are coming from.
Yeah, maybe more than possible, maybe essential. <laughs> Critical. I mean, yeah. I, I think so, because especially in our society, where such a small fraction of our of our citizenry do military service, it's, it's a very, very dangerous thing to have uh, that divide between the civilian world. I, I think, so I think, yeah, one of the big takeaways of the Tet Offensive is it's not that the media, you know, cut us off the knees, it's that the media has an important and sometimes dangerous and sometimes messy role to play in, in, in our foreign wars. And it should always be that way. Yeah. Yes. And I think, you know, another takeaway, you know, if I, if I understand you correctly is, is that, You know, we should be we should be reluctant to look at one image or one news article or one dispatch, and uh, you know, make make big broad assumptions about it. For example, we we shouldn't assume that it's necessarily wrong or biased, but by the same mm -hmm. token, we shouldn't assume that it's complete, right? A lot of right. times, what you get uh, is a, a true story mm -hmm. that is simply not the full picture. Yeah, I mean, in a way that maybe it's a snapshot. The average person can relate to, um, you know, those of you who are not historians. Just think about how how um, a movie or a TV show is made, right? Very few of them, you know, like 1917, that movie accepted is not a real time. They they selectively choose what scenes, what time to show, what angles. I mean, it's all chosen. Now, it's not necessarily chosen to deceive you. But it is chosen to tell a story, to mm -hmm. create a narrative. And that's how we function as human beings. And, and you know, the media, in a sense, is, is, is works that way, too. You have to tell a story. You can't just barf on everybody right. with every piece of information you have. You have to try to select the things that are most important and say, this is why it's important. But that's yeah. not everything that there is. Right, right. But, you know, there's so that we we don't have time to go down that rabbit hole, but mm -hmm. I have rather strong feelings about, you know, they're not entirely clear, but right. they're very strong feelings about the role of professional editors in determining yes. what we yeah. see and how it's yeah. presented. Because, and we'll, you know, we should in the age, always in, be mindful of that. Yeah. In the age of social media, that and, and just basically the, the, the decim, decimation of newsrooms. Yes. Uh, followed by the rise of social media that role uh, is, is missing. And I, you know, it, there, there are upsides and downsides to that, but, yeah. but you know, some, some days of the week, I feel like there are a lot more downsides. I, I hear you and I, I feel the same. Yeah. All right. Well, last question. Uh, is there anything we didn't talk about that you think is uh, essential to share? Is there any question that you wish I had asked you that I didn't? Um, I, th I think uh, we cover a lot of uh, good territory. Um, this talk, I, I can't think of anything in particular about, you know, Tet Offensive that we, that we, uh, you know, missed um, this time around that was essential to, to what we wanted to handle. I certainly would enjoy coming back and talking about, you know, other things and hopefully we'll have a chance to do that. But uh, I think uh, this was, uh, this was, yeah, this was a definitely an enjoyable um, if, if, you know, concise kind of look at one of these, um, you know, big events, one of the most important things that have happened in our society, you know, in the last uh, 75 years.